name is Clarence Larson, director of the videotape historical project featuring pioneers of science and technology. This project is being carried out in cooperation with the National Academy of Engineering. Today, October 17th, we are videotaping Dr. Alexander Hollander, who has had a distinguished career in biological research. He has held responsible positions in the National Institutes of Health, was director of the biology division of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and is presently director of the Council for Research Planning in the Biological Sciences. A detailed biological sketch is given at the end of a short notice about the discovery of the Raman effect. And, uh, my major professor, John Don Williams, said, why don't you check it as a bachelor's thesis? Of course, my first shot was right, very successful. It's not a very complicated thing if you know how to do it. And handed the spectrum up and, and so on. And I calculated, I think, an acetone, and uh, it turned out to be correct uh, structure, and appeared in the physical review of Sebastian's thesis. But, let's see, what, um, what year was that again, Dr. 29. 1929. Good. Then, I, for my master's degree, I did a number of other chemicals, same very scattering. Also on hydrate, water of hydration, copper sulfate, and a lot of other things. So I had two more articles in physical review, and for my PhD, I think I had two or three additional ones. So in 31, they gave me my PhD in physical chemistry. By then, I was got very much interested in biology, and I really worked more with Farrington Daniels, who was a photochemist, did a lot of photochemistry also constructed the Coolidge tube, till Coolidge gave him one, and, and used uh, electron scattering work, which he investigated on bi biological effects. Of course, Farrington Daniels uh, uh, was known for his uh, tremendous uh, work in uh, physical chemistry. In fact, uh, it seems to me I remember that Farrington Daniels uh, wrote the book, textbook on physical chemistry, which had from 80 to 90 percent of the uh, of the uh, physical chemistry textbook business uh, right. for a while. And I prepared a subject index on it because I needed a summer job. Oh yeah, well, I still have, uh, I, I taught uh, physical chemistry uh, uh, while I was at the University of the Pacific uh, and uh, he, uh, we, I used his uh, text and uh, it, it was by far the most under, understandable text. Yes. And, and I took, of course, the, train, the course he gave in physical chemistry. Where Williams gave more choroid chemistry, and later on changed entirely to choroid chemistry, and I stayed with Farrington and Daniels. Uh, at that time in 31, 30, 31, this was a very exciting period with all the developments in, in physics and particle physics and Niels Bohr and, and, and all the new developments. It's out, something like this ought to happen in, in biology too, but things don't happen always this way. In any case, at that time, I, I had taken a training, a course in probability in Baum Weaver at Wisconsin, who was a professor of mathematics, who later on went over to Rockefeller Foundation and became in charge of the basic biology, biological and biophysical sciences. He's the man who later on coined the word molecular biology. And he could visualize things are coming up. He talked to me about a phenomenon a Russian investigator, Professor Alexander Govich, had reported about when cells divide, they give up a small amount of ultraviolet and make other cells divide. This initiates cell division. And he proved it, he thought he proved it by using onion root tips, which has an area of quickly dividing cells right or, or ahead of the cap. There's a little cap which pushes into the soil. And they're dividing cells. These cells divide very rapidly, and you can follow them very easily under the microscope by making sections. And he thought these quickly dividing cells, if they are directed against other cells which are still resting, they will get started to divide. He thought he had proven it. Well, I tried to check him, Pine Daniel suggested, I check it and see what, 
I said, I can't find it. It doesn't walk with me. And uh, I said, it should walk because he by then has reported he can put this wood tip in front of a spectrograph and he can get the spectrum of emitted light at the end by having the wood tips lined up and recognize where there is an increase in dividing cells. This is where the wavelength which is given up. Sounds very complicated. It's really quite simple to do. I couldn't find it. So Juan Weaver, or Dr. Robbins, the head of the, uh, the father of the guy who is now in charge of the Institute of Medicine, was a very good plant physiologist at the University of Missouri, later on New York Botanical Garden. He said, Hollander, why don't you go to Russia? We sent you there. Check with this man and see if, has he got something? Because if, it, if he is right, this might be the, one of the most important phenomena we can discover. And he is being backed by very important people. Uh, Gerlach in Munich is backing him. Very famous of Gerlach, the famous Gerlach experiment. And uh, the. Uh, and the. Uh, Jaffe, the head of the Leicester Institute, the one, uh, one of the most famous physicists at the time. In any case, they all had greatest respect for this man, Gorbach. And he went ahead and kept on publishing. So did other people. So I came to, uh, to Leningrad and worked in this laboratory. And I needed better physics contact. So I contacted people in Lesnoy, which was a famous physics institute outside uh, Leningrad. And I explained to Jaffe that I have problems and I need some physical help. Well, they helped me, but they couldn't see how the amount of radiation given up after going on through a spectrograph, which loses more than 90% of all the radiation, 99%. You know very little, this is all scattered and reflected and you don't get it out. So I worked there for three months and I didn't get it. And I said, I don't get it. I can go back and try it again. So I came back to New York. This is all paid for by the Rockefeller Foundation. I was the first Rockefeller fellow in, in the Soviet Union then. This before even an ambassador was there. Yes. We had it, what, uh, what year again was that now? This was in 33. In 33, yes. And I, we went there on October, exactly 50 years ago, it's quite a memorial. Oh, yes. And I got there on the 1st of October and I stayed till the 31st of December. And there's no point hanging around here. The guy is a lousy experimenter. And if I co question him, he doesn't like it. And I, when I set it up, I, it's always for me at the borderline. Sometimes I get a little bit, next time I don't get it again. And I said, it's, when you have borderline phenomena, the way your results will come, they will be scattered around. And I said, I better get back and get into real work. It is no point. So when I got to New York, on the first week in January, uh, 34, I came to Baron Weaver and Baron Weaver said, Hollander, we want you to check it as thoroughly as you can. We will get the money to the National Academy, National Research Council, and do it wherever you want. You want to do it at Harvard, or you can do it at Wisconsin, or wherever you like. At the time, Dubridge was the head of the physics department of the University of Rochester. And I said, I like somebody else to check me. I don't want to do it alone because it's much more acceptable if somebody else sees what I am doing and check me and see if, if, am I correct or do I make mistakes. And, and Dubuch is a very good physicist, I don't, no question about it. Well, Dubuch took it on. By that time, a man, Otto Rahn, a very good bacteriologist, said he had it. He even published a book or two on the same subject. I said, my suggestion is, I will set up a little laboratory in medicine at the university. The physicists will help me. They're all very much interested in this phenomenon. And let Dubuch check it in uh, torches. And Dubuch said, I'd like to. I said, bring the, 
Dr. Rahn's assistant here, and they will do the work for you. But you supervise it on, on the physics department. So I ran between Rochester on, on Madison, but this is a little later. In, in between, Van Weaver said, Alex, could you make a survey of the biological effects of radiation? I think this is going to become a very important field. Nobody else believes it. But I need a kind of survey which will tell us at the Rockefeller Foundation what we should support. And then he told me the example of Lawrence coming with a little thing like this, which was laid on the cyclotron, and asked for help from Rockefeller Foundation. He said, Donna is giving him some money. Couldn't Rockefeller give him a little money that he can build a little bigger instrument? And he said, of course we give him the money. We think it's a very promising thing. We have a great respect for him. In any case, he said, make the survey as long as you want, maybe 10 months or so, and then tell us what we should support. So I took Mr. Horner and I brought my nephew from Germany that I had to get out anyway. And we three walked in the Rockefeller Library on the New York Academy of Medicine. And we reviewed about 5,000 papers for him. These papers, and we made certain recommendations where there's promise for quantitative work. Not good work only, but where you can make some measurements on biological effects of radiation. And this formed the basis for the support of Rockefeller Foundation of Radiation Biology, and they supported it continuously. By that time, Hermann Muller had reported in 27 mutation production by ionizing radiation on Drosophila. No question about it. He developed a very good quantitative method so he could show it, demonstrate it. They supported this also through the National Research Council. I came then also under the National Research Council. They supported me. And uh, uh, after the survey I made, which I published in three volumes, but I evaluated and criticized different papers, and they wouldn't publish it. They just made 150 copies and gave it to different universities. I still have a copy, and I'm sure the foundation has it too. It's a very interesting you know, what I thought was good and was not so good. It's very remarkable that the, uh, uh, that the Rockefeller Foundation has uh, either been very lucky or very pers uh, had uh, a very good perspective on what uh, would be the important things in science, and, you know, in the, not only in the field of biology, but as you mentioned, the, the story about uh, Lawrence and the cyclotron, and uh, there's so many of these things that they uh, were able to uh, actually uh, locate the, the pioneers in these fields, and their uh, their results have been remarkable. Yeah, and of course, when you do stick out your neck, you, some will not work out, like the mitogenetic rays didn't work out. Mm -hmm. I worked on it for five years, uh, for four years, till I got tired of it and published a monograph and showed uh, that I was not able to find it. You can never show the negative anyway. And by then, 800 papers had appeared on the subject, on 15 books. I That's got, remarkable. They are in the archives in uh, UT, I got them. And uh, the, the moment my monograph, which is number 100 of the National Academy, National Research Council, appeared, oh, about one or two papers have appeared. People just dropped it like this. Well, that, that's, uh, that's amazing, which <coughs> essentially goes to show that uh, there are many of the uh, sometimes uh, fashions or uh, things that people think are going to be important that just don't work out. Yeah. There are many other examples, only today I think it's harder for people to drop an unpro unprofitable line of research work. At that time, the wavelengths were supposed to be between 1950 to uh, 3,000 3, angstroms, 4,000 angstroms. He was in the right region for the nucleic acid, but he didn't know it. He didn't know nucleic acid. He was a cytologist, a histologist, and a lousy experimenter. And so I went back to Wisconsin in October 1934 set up after my experiments and I got a physicist in, Walter Klaus. You remember him? Oh yes. Yeah, we, both, we published together. Yes. 
and we could he worked with the Geiger counter and I did it biologically. We couldn't find it. But what we what I found was that the stimulating effect of radiation it if you give a child a chance to repair itself after radiation, before it starts cell division, if you keep it at a low enough temperature, not too low, it must have metabolism. But it's uh, yeast, uh, bacteria divided uh, 20, uh, 37 degrees, wherever you keep the culture on 15, 16 degrees for uh, six, eight hours, and the cell will repair a good part of the damage which ultraviolet radiations produce. I'm talking about ultraviolet now. And uh, to do this kind of work quantitatively, we had to make our own lamps. I had my own monocorbator. Uh, I uh, uh, Dan showed me. I learned all these techniques from Dan. He was a very good teacher and he was very patient with me. We became very close friends. He treated me like I would have been a son. Yeah. And, wow. and uh, he showed me all the tricks, how to, all the photochemical tricks. And uh, I built my own thermopile. Uh, yes, you couldn't buy any of these things, besides there was no money for research at that time. Yes, uh, well, of course, uh, incidentally, on that, uh, uh, getting good ultraviolet sources must have been very difficult uh, in those days. Uh, what regions were you working in, primarily? Uh, what I, regions I worked of the between 1950 and 4000. Oh, yes. Uh, That's the region. Mm -hmm. But mostly one to 3000 angstrom. Oh, yes. You see, I was interested in nucleic acid. So, uh, after I gave up the mitogenetic race, I concentrated using monochromatic radiation to see whether I can recognize the chemical inside itself, which is responsible for a certain function by destroying it with monochromatic ultraviolet radiation. And I used a very good monochromator, which I had bought myself with my own money from Steinheil in, in Munich. And, uh, uh, so when I moved from, uh, I got tired of all this, and besides I wanted to get out of medicine, and I took a job with the Biophysical Institute here in Washington at the NIH. Brockett was in charge, F.S. Brockett, Frederick Brockett. And uh, first thing I set up is my monochromaton, my own lamps, and my radiation source. By the way, Cooper built me a current source. He worked there too, Desmond Cooper you know, up at Brookhaven. Oh, yes. And uh, it was a quite a nice group, a biophysics group at the NIH. Later on, it was changed to biophysical biology, and now I don't know, they call it something else. And uh, I turned out the wavelength dependence, I recognized that certain fungi, when you produce mutations, produce very striking color mutations. And there was a very good uh, mycologist at the, uh, at the NIH, Chester Emmons, who worked on trichopitin. Trichopitin is the, uh, is the athlete's foot fungus, and also it goes between you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but he knew how to, I couldn't really make any mistakes with him because he knew the fungus so well, because he had to be sure that he has the right strains, otherwise he messed up his whole laboratory. So we work together on this, and the wavelength depends first of killing off of uh, the fungus, which was mostly around 2650. But then the mutation production came in, and these, I noticed these color mutations, and I could count them. They're very simple, or a, a colony shape, and they're very quantitative. So if you give a, a 10,000 Hertz, you get certain amount. 20,000, you get twice as many color mutations or uh, morphological mutations. Which incidentally, on a plate. Yes. On a plate dish. Fine. And is uh, incidentally, is uh, uh, fun, uh, are fungi uh, more susceptible to uh, radiation mutations than say uh, uh, bacteria or plants or is no there bacteria something? are much more sensitive. They are more sensitive. sensitive. Uh, Ultraviolet, but then yeah. if the ultraviolet can penetrate, fun fungus spores are almost as sensitive as bacteria, but oh, yeah. usually they are pigmented so you don't get the, the full force of the ultraviolet which you expose them to. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, when I counted these uh, mutations, the maximum was always around 2650, this is the residence line of mercury. This is the wavelength which is most highly absorbed by uh, uh, nucleic acid. You know, the ring structure absorbs the around 2600. Yes. Now, if it would have been a protein, the wavelength would be 2850, 2900 angstroms, if the maximum would have been there. But the curve was very striking, with a tremendous maximum at 2650, and then a little maximum at a very little one at, at 2800, which means there's a little protein too. And yeah, incidentally, on the, on the clay gas, uh, uh, of course, these, uh, this was very early, and uh, uh, was there very much known about the role of uh, nucleic acid? Nucleic acid has been very uh, interesting to the chemists, and it was the, uh, uh, all of the constituent parts have been well worked on, even yeah. in the early 30s. But as I remember, there wasn't no... Uh, very much known about its biological significance. Perhaps you might want to correct me on that. That's correct. The people thought that the, we had many discussions with the, in the genetic society. We had some uh, workshops at Woods Hall. And the, they were called gene conferences in the 30s. Thomas and Morgan were there, or Barbara McClintock was there. All the geneticists came to this. And the discussion was, is the gene a protein or is it a nucleic acid? If you would have put it up to a word, I would say 90-95% of the people would have said, of the genetics would have said, it must be a protein. The nucleic acid does not have enough information. This was a general opinion. So when I did it in 38, on the term the wavelength dependence, on the pound of maximum at 2650, clean cut, there's no question about it, it's in the books. As a matter of fact, one of the good books produced all the illustrations from this work. And nobody really won't believe it. I, I was at a AAAS meeting, this American Association of Advancement of Science meeting, so usually around Christmas at that time, in Richmond, Virginia, and I had my poops there. And Fang Niles came to me and said, Alex, I, I can see it is right. But Stadler, who had worked on the wavelength dependence of mutation production in corn. He's the man uh, Barbara McClinton worked with at, at, uh, at, uh, at Missouri. And uh, he said, Alex, he just ran the pollen grain through, and I have a very good physical chemist, Uber. I said, yes, he's a good physical chemist. And we, the wavelength we find is the one absorbed by proteins. I don't think your book is right. I think ours, we, we, we have a very nice book. I yes. said, let me see it. I said, he did not take into account the yellow pigment on the pollen grain. If he had taken the account of the yellow, of the yellow pigment on the pollen grain, he would have gotten exactly the same maximum I have. This was at Christmas, so he went back to Missouri, and, and, and a couple of months later, he called me and said, Alex, you are right. That, that's an amazing uh, story, because there was the first, uh, first real book. hint of the mechanism of, yeah. uh, of uh, Now, gene. I was up for the $1,000 price, because I and I said, Alex, this is the most marvelous stuff. And so a lot of other people, but Charles said, I don't believe it, because I found it. Well, and then he went home and checked it. He bought it. He came to see me in, in Bethesda. And these came people from another photochemist from Stanford. They all came to see me. They said, my God, maybe I, have, I, I am right. It turned out I was right. And I published it with the beautiful graphs in the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium of 41. And, and it's in there. And it's been reproduced in many of the books. Oh, yeah. Now, incidentally, on that, what uh, the uh, what the maximum absorption and the nucleic acid uh, the twenty six hundred. What is it for the proteins that were twenty nine hundred twenty nine fifty? Yeah, so there's it's easy, easy enough. Yes, yes. No, the distance yes. is great enough. Yes. Even the crude walk you can yes. see it. And so that well, that was uh, very interesting. Incidentally, of course, uh, you can. Uh, 
Uh, you can isolate the nucleic acid and you can isolate these proteins yes, we did this in, uh, down, yeah. and uh, you can uh, do it so-called in vitro with more or less pure substances and, did and get the absorption. Uh, in the 40s we did yeah. irradiated nucleic acid for a while and we polymerized it. Oh yes. Nobody ever caught it. I just about six months ago somebody said, why never doesn't anybody caught these 40 papers on nucleic acids? Mm -hmm. I said, well, uh, what you do? Yes. Well, this is why uh, why we should talk about these things because yeah. the origin of so many of these things are just lost in the masses of literature and never quite uh, they're in the literature, but they never get emphasized and the, they never uh, you never get the feel for the proper relationships of That's these right. very important findings. So uh, I'm. I went to the International uh, Genetics Congress in '39 in Edinburgh, and I had convinced Herman Muller that I was right because, well, you had the culture there. There was no question about it. He brought Timothy Kosovsky, the famous Russian uh, geneticist, to me and said, "Alex, you explain it to Timothy." And uh, I showed it to him. He said, "Holland, I don't believe it." I said, "Why don't you believe it?" I said there is not enough information in the nucleic acid to give the gene directions what it should do. You have to have something as complicated as a protein. I said, well, I, I, all I can say is I changed the gene, the function of the gene by destroying or changing the nucleic acid. There's no question about it. Uh, that uh, is really remarkable because as uh, as we can uh, see it now, uh, uh, if people had, had realized this, uh, well, we could have made a lot faster progress in oh, yeah, unraveling a lot more focus. But they also didn't believe Avery. You know, Avery is a, was a bacteriologist who worked on pneumococcus. And the different strains of pneumococci carry different mucus on their surface, which is a very important function of the pneumococcus. Now what Avery did, he took one strain of pneumococcus, washed off this outside mucus, then took another strain, an entirely different strain, washed this mucus off and put it in the mucus from the previous strain and he transferred the property, the special strain property, from one strain to the other. Then he analyzed, he and McCarthy and you know, somebody else, analyzed the stoppage they was off and this was a nucleic acid. Well, that's, uh, that's an amazing... And people didn't believe it. Yeah. That's an amazing, uh, amazing story there. And uh, as I, I this often was wondered why uh, uh, why this uh, the nucleic acid role uh, uh, didn't develop uh, faster is and as a matter of fact as an undergraduate I did have uh, the uh, the task in organic chemistry special project yeah. to isolate uh, uh, nucleic acid from brewer's yeast I yeah. believe and at that time of course it was very interesting chemically and the chemistry was well worked out yes but uh, nobody had any idea the role of nucleic acid as far as i can remember i couldn't think of anything i uh, re uh, had read about the the importance or the me mechanism uh, of nucleic acid uh, at that time so uh, it, it took watson crick model until they developed their the helix model to bring out all these things. Now, in some of the books they mention my book, others they don't. They don't know what the wavelength dependence is. Yeah. Well, that wavelength dependence was, of course, a, a very important clue. Yeah. Which, uh, without without which, uh, we uh, we might have been blind to, to the real roles for a long, much longer time. Well, when Watson Crick came out, of course, they never already saw it, that that the nucleic acid has plenty of information. You can handle it all. Oh yeah. And so it, it turned out. Of course, at that time when I worked in, Beth uh, in Bethesda, 
Oh, when I walked down to Oak Ridge, Watson wanted to come and walk with me. But he had to form out, fill out security clearance, you know, at that time still. Oh, yes. Remember. And I, he said, I'm going to fill it out, Alex, I can come. Oh. Yeah. So, Durbeko wanted to come with me too. They both got Nobel Prizes. That's you right. always lose a big fish, you know, it's like a fisherman, the big ones get away. Yeah, that's, that's right. Well, uh, that's amazing having two uh, future Nobel Prize winners yeah, uh, they both won get, the uh, get off the hook, so to speak. Yeah, well, they, were, they saw that I am I'm very receptive to new ideas, and I go ahead and encourage them. I said, try it. If it doesn't work, well, you haven't lost much. Every once in a while, you're going to lose one. So, uh, this worked out very well. Now, also, in the, when I worked in the, I worked in the Bartley department, actually, it was Council of Relative Chemistry. To work with a man, BMW, a very good scientist, not thinking along genetic lines. I wanted to do the genetics work right at Wisconsin, and I was still there checking on mitogenetic race. But he did not believe in mutations in fungi, you know, he was an old fashioned plant physiologist. He, they had a special name for the type. Uh, changes you observe in, in fungi, they, they were not calling mutations. And he was against the idea when I said, talked about mutations. So the moment I left uh, Madison and the next four weeks I, I had I, right there, there and I, they would let me, they, they didn't encourage me. Now we worked, I worked with him on tobacco mosaic, which was a very important item at the time, this before we knew that you can crystallize tobacco mosaic. Yeah, was that that was the first uh, uh, virus to be crystallized? Yeah. Was it the yes. tobacco and mosaic? Yes, he uh, and Stanley worked in uh, Northrop's laboratory in Princeton. The Rockefeller University Institute had a laboratory in Princeton, and he worked there. And uh, so I took the tobacco mosaic and determined the wavelength dependence, and I found it is a nuclear protein. It has both nucleic acids and proteins. I can inactivate the both with either one. Not like the mutation production, which is a purely nucleic acid effect. Mm -hmm. But this was a nucleic acid protein effect. And uh, I worked with BN Dogger and I repeated it about 10 times. I said, there it is. Let's send it in. Let's publish it. So Dogger sent it to the Journal of General Physiology. It was a Rockefeller journal. And Stanley was on the editorial board. He sent it back and he said it's wrong. I don't believe there's any nucleic acid in tobacco mosaic. This is before he, the English found out there's a lot of it there. And uh, sent it back. And, and I said, Doug, we, let's publish it somewhere else. Why the hell? And so we published, he published it in Proceeds of the National Academy. He was a member of the National Academy. Oh, yes. Yeah. And it's published, I think, in 36 or 37. It's my most quoted paper. Ever, it's been repeated many times by other people. And I was at a biophysics meeting, I don't know, about 15 years ago, and they discussed the structure of nuclear protein. And uh, they brought up that it's, it's a nuclear protein, it's not a protein, pure protein. Yeah. The English had already found out they found the nucleic acid in there. And they said, well, why doesn't somebody determine it? They said, some crazy guy did it 10 years ago. And here's the graph. He showed my graph. I said, the crazy guy is right here. Ah, right <laughs> oh, that's an amazing story there, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, he did it in a nice way. He said, yeah. somebody did it a long time before anybody knew it was a nuclear protein. Yeah. So I had another thing I, I mentioned. Uh, uh, I found that uh, I could recognize repair that if I kept, I mentioned this before, cells after radiation in a lower temperature, they would repair a lot and then when you fade them out, you have a lot higher percentage surviving than the normal, which forms the basis for the repair processes papers, which now appear on the books and papers. It took 30 years before somebody quoted it. And they are, now they reprinted this a little article. And, uh, but these were very exciting times. But I spent most of my time on ultraviolet. And the reason is probably I can handle it. I knew ultraviolet very well. I can produce it. 
I can measure it very exactly, much better than ionizing radiation. But later on, when I was at the NIH, I did a lot of work on ionizing radiation, on nucleic acids and on, on, on other things. And, uh, uh, and I drifted much more into ion effects of ionizing radiation than on, uh, on ultraviolet. And I got much more deeply involved in nucleic acids. Now, this, during the war years, uh, in the 40s, a problem came up, uh, an airborne infection, that ultraviolets were affected with, if the ultraviolet penetrates bacteria very readily, they're small and often they usually don't have pigment, so it kills bacteria very readily with very small amounts of energy. And you can use it for sterilizing air. You just blow the air over an a low pressure lamp, once you sterilize it. If the lamp is clean, you have to be sure it's clean, otherwise the little grease will absorb the ultraviolet. So I, the NIH had observed in the boys' trading school right outside Washington here, that when the boys come in, they all get sick of a respiral infection right away. It's, and they think that the air contain, carries a lot of microorganisms and viruses which make these boys very well sick. And I wonder whether ultraviolet would control this. I said, we can try it. We got the General Electric Design in Amps or Westinghouse, and we fixed up a dormitory. And, uh, and it was much too difficult to control. I don't think the data mean very much. We published it, but they, they are very good. The, the background of these boys is much too diversified, and they go out and run off. It didn't mean to have much, but it had some effect. You could measure it. You could measure that the number of bacteria had decreased in the womb when you established all the world. So during the war, I was asked to do it on submarine. I did a lot of work on submarines from New London for the NIH, for the Navy, and to control. The trouble on submarines is when they go out on a, on a patrol, yeah, if somebody sneezes a little bit, the whole bell runs get it. Oh, yes. So uh, they, they, they wanted something to control, so we put these limbs in air ducts. At the same time, Dr. I forgot the name of the man at the University of Chicago, uh, sprayed the public glycol into the wounds, which will do it too. Will, put, will reduce the upper respiratory infection. Also, the oil, the blankets, they will also reduce the uh, upper respiratory infection. But none of these help too much because by then, uh, sulfur dogs came in. And of course, they used sulfur dogs to excess and they got a lot of people sick, which would control upper respiratory infection. Very good. We're, all right, we are now recording uh, the second uh, portion of this. And so, I would say, uh, would you just continue from where you left off, Dr. Hollander, and, and uh, we'll see how things work out. I, and I produced these mutations in trichophyton. I mentioned the color mutations, morphological mutations, and other things. And especially could I see that certain of these mutations produce a lot of pigments. Sometimes there would be an, a, a clear area around the colony. In others, there would be a lot of pigments, red pigments, blue pigments, or even had green pigments. Trichophyton is a very uh, unstable uh, uh, fungus, so it mutates very easily, and in very high percentage, I had as high as 20, 30, and occasionally even 40% of all it says which would survive would be mutated, which is very striking. I said, well, if they mutate at that time, the story of penicillin came up. Flory published the paper, and, uh, and Heatley, and so on. What year was this? Uh, it must have been 1941 or 42. 41, oh, yes. I, I think it's 41, 40, 41. This was considerably after the discovery of penicillin. Yeah, probably was 10 years earlier. Various progress was very slow during that first 10 years. Yeah, probably it was slow because uh, 
the British did not want to patent it, and as a result, there's no commercial company would contact it and delayed apparently the development of penicillin production. But maybe it wouldn't, I don't know. In any case, I said if you produce so much increase in pigment or in clear area around the colonies, we must be also able to do this on penicillin autotum, the penicillin producer. So I started out radiating penicillin autotum and then plating it out and isolating the colonies and see whether they have high increased penicillin production. But to do this, you've got to go through thousands of colonies before you find the one which were a high producer. I could establish that the penicillin production follows a maximum distribution of penicillin and I could shift the maximum to higher penicillin production. At least I could find a lot of colonies which had increased penicillin production, even if the maximum was not necessarily there. So one could pick these colonies with a very high penicillin production, isolate them, and see if they, are, if they continue and they transmit it. Now to do this, one had to do a lot, a lot of legwork, a lot of detailed work which technicians could do it. At that time, I had only one assistant, and I, I was very anxious to do the job. So I asked the NIH to support me, and they said, oh, we don't believe in it. We don't, we don't know whether there's anything to this penicillin production, whether there's any value. So I went down and talked to, at the National Academy, I talked to Bert Hastings. He said, Alex, we want to give you the money. Hire two, three assistants and then go do the screening. He said, you've got to give it to the NIH because I'm on the civil service. And you have to give it to Dyer, who is the director of the NIH, and he will then appoint the assistant. He wrote a letter to Dr. Dyer, which upset the upper card, apparently. I didn't do it in the high grade. In any case, he called me over to his office and he had his assistant director and one he said, we don't believe in penicillin. If you want to do the work, fine, you are an independent scientist. You are civil service. But, but if you would have been a commission officer, we know exactly what we would have done with you. So if you want to continue, fine. If you, It's up to you. We will not give you any further assistance. That is, an, uh, that is an amazing story, but a very familiar one. And of course, uh, actually, uh, we these days we use the uh, term uh, NIH in the sense of not invented here. And uh, I think uh, that has uh, somewhat of a mindset in many individuals. And it's a rather strange coincidence that it was an official of the NIH who uh, <laughs> was governed by that not invented here syndrome. So I went back to Bear Hastings and told him what has happened. He said, Alex, I get the colonies tested for you. Merck is trying to get into the business. And Merck is one of our advisory board here. Sent the colonies up to Merck and they will test it for you. And they did the testing and they showed there was increased penicillin production. And I published this in the proceedings in, I think, 1942 of the Missouri Botanical Garden. Of course, never caught it. But then other people got interested, and I worked very close with Demons and Courts from Harvard, who, was in, who hired Barbara Grinder, also was in charge of the course being Harvard, I was told. And I uh, told him all about it, and he said, well, suppose we do it in Courts from Harvard, I can do whatever I want. I um, have permission to go into microorganism work. So he sent his assistants to me in Bethesda, and I trained them, and there we did the screening for the uh, penicillin production. Then the people at Wisconsin heard about it, this Fritz Stauffer. He called me up and he said, Alex, can I use your, old, there's an old monochromator. Can I do this on, on, on the penicillin colonies? The way you did it. And, and we still have your old exposure chamber and everything there in the tank. He said, go ahead. It's really quite simple. Look at my papers and you can know. And you all know how I did it. And this is the best penicillin production which was produced during the war in, uh, in the United States. Now, the people from Oxford sent Dr. Heatley over, who was one of the co-operators with, uh, with Flory, and I taught him the technique and he took it back to Oxford and they did it there too. 
That's, a, that's an amazing story because I think all of us who uh, delved into uh, the story of penicillin realize that uh, it, during and shortly after the war it saved literally millions of uh, lives yeah. and uh, it, is, uh, it is amazing how, uh, uh, how a few, people, uh, a few p people can make an awful lot of difference uh, in how fast uh, and the direction in which uh, a success in science is achieved. You see, all these experiences, of course, prepared me for operation. I said, if I run a laboratory, I'm going to let the young guy go ahead and let him do the job if he wants to. It, and it worked. It worked very well. Well, fine. Well, I'm very anxious to hear the background of how you started the uh, Oak Ridge uh, Biological Laboratories. I, in '46, I worked at this biophysics school at the Division of Industrial Medicine or Physical Biology, or they call it that. And uh, they had sent a Dr. Ip uh, Underwand down to see if he would like to take, he was a cancer man, a very good one, which was died a year ago, whether he would be willing to set up a laboratory down there. Dr. Thomas from Monsanto thought some advantage should be taken of the capability of having different types of uh, isotopes and ionizing and different radiation types available to develop a biology division down there. And so he approached the Surgeon General, Dr. Perry, to do this. Well, Underwood turned it down and they asked me would I be willing to. I took a look at it. There wasn't anything there. But I thought if I get good support and a lot of intelligent people in Oak Ridge, Maybe we can develop something. I always wanted to do pioneer work. I even went out to the West to see if I wouldn't set up a fur farm or something like this, because I thought this is the way you do pioneer work. Of course, you don't these days. And so I had my chance to go out and do something different and new, and develop a laboratory which would fit my ideas, the way biology should be done, special emphasis on genetics. So I came down to Oak Ridge and Vigna said, well, what would you like to do if you come down here? See, pardon me for interrupting there. Uh, what year was that? Was that 1946? That's right. I thought it was either 46 or 47. No. And I can personally remember distinctly, uh, I think there was a reception uh, uh, down at Oak Ridge. I was not connected with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory at that time, but I can remember distinctly uh, talking to you and uh, I added my uh, voice and trying to persuade you to c come down at that time. Of course, Clark Center uh, clicked right away. He yeah. could see that this could be developed, uh, something could be done. And uh, so I went there on civil service down there. But it turned out it was too difficult for me to travel on, on government money because I had to run around and find people to help me develop the laboratory. And, and Victor said, what would you like to do? I said, well, I have good idea. I have ideas. I write them down for you. I'll tell you what I would like to do. So I, the memorandum is still available, which I prepared for Vigna. Vigna is a very intelligent guy, and I have to tell you this. And he, he said, go ahead. I don't know anything about biology, but just see what you want to do. And of course, I emphasize genetics emphasized biochemistry. I underestimated somewhat the importance of doing animal work. Uh, later on I corrected this. But he said in the long run I have to do it on mammals. And we need to have a not only work on bacteria, fungi, parmesium, everything else, those off, everything else under the sun. We need also to have a parallel experiment on mice or whatever animal we want to use to see if we can recognize the implications of ionizing radiation on man. This is closer to man, this is the way we want to have to do it. There was great opposition to this idea to follow mutations in mice. It's too difficult, it's very expensive, you waste a lot of money. And you could get all this information from bacteria, fungi, and so Drosophila. 99% of the geneticists were against it. 
There are only two optogeneticists, so they are really two of the best who, at that time, who backed me. One was Sewell Wright, who was still alive, he's so 93 or 92, and Hermann Muller. They backed me. But they said, how are you going to find somebody to do an experiment like this on mice? It will take a lifetime. And you go, it will cost millions of dollars. I said, well, we'll find the money somehow. I have good backing in Washington, who Strauss always said he will help me if it's necessary. And uh, what to find a man to, who was willing to spend 20, 30 years on it, that's what it takes. So uh, finally I heard there's trouble at Bar Harbor. There's a very good geneticist there who had some fa uh, uh, family trouble and, and I think he's getting a divorce and he's marrying the assistant or something like this. I said, I don't care. I take him down and we interview him. And I thought he, he could, he's a very good geneticist, he could do the job. They saw it, Bill Russell. He said, I cannot come because I'm going to get married to uh, Lee uh, Brauch very shortly. You're going to have to hire her too. I said, can I talk to her? And can I have a reference her? I called Sue Wright. He said, oh, she's smart as a devil. You don't make a mistake. I'm sorry this mess happened up at, at Bar Harbor because Elizabeth Russell is also very smart and a very good geneticist. But this has happened, nothing we can do about it. I said, so I hired Lee Russell as assistant, I know what, in 48, 47, 48. And this is the origin of the mouse genetic study. But the mouse genetic study was designed by Russell, not by me. I had a vague idea how to do it. As a matter of fact, I offered the job first to a man in, in London, a very good mouse geneticist, Greenberg. He said, oh, I don't believe this can be done. Ten years later, he wanted the job. Of course, I had to wrestle back. <laughs> In any case, it turned out very well and forms the basis of radiation uh, exposure limits, which we are setting up. It's one of the crucial experiments. The uh, uh, Atomic Energy Commission and then supported and still supporting. The, uh, in the years, 30 years since this took place, this is 55, 25 years, yeah, it's more than 30 years, 47. It took 10 years before we got good results, before he got good results, it's not mine. But you cannot keep the morale of a laboratory for 10 years without having good publications, besides you don't get support. So by surrounding this this semi-applied experiment, which is really not semi-applied, it's really a basic experiment. With a lot of work on Drosophila, Parmesan, my own work on bacteria and fungi, we had a constant stream of publication from the first day I got to Oak Ridge. And at one time, I think the biology division published more than 90% of all the publications of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory because a lot of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory publications were restricted publication by necessity or failure to declassify things. And, uh, but it worked, worked very well. As a matter of fact, Oak Ridge, uh, 1950, so I am told now, till 65, was the center of the world for modern genetics and did the pioneer work on a lot of new developments. There were some certain interesting things. We were, I, of course, I was very much interested in nucleic acids. So I said, we need to set up a little group of nucleic acids where I got Nick Carter. And uh, while the coal wanted to come over with him, and I said, go with Nick. And uh, Waldo took a little time to find himself with the iron exchange methods, and then he did very well, they were separating new uh, breakdown products of nucleic acids. But the people in Washington, couldn't see why we should work with radiation on nucleic acids. And I explained to them the most effective way of ionizing radiation is on the chromosomes, on the gene. And it consists mostly of nucleic acids. So we better find out what the nucleic acid is doing there and, and how does it behave. As a matter of fact, this forms the basis for the recognizing uh, uh, messenger RNA, 
by Volker and Astrakhan. This was the first time it had been discovered. And there are a lot of interesting things I can give in details on, on the different developments in the, in, in the biology division. This is probably a good story by, by itself. Somebody has how to give it. Yes, this is a, this is a fascinating story of the inside of, of this uh, genetics program. And I think uh, it's also uh, very important that uh, uh, you had a broad-based approach to, uh, to this problem. And even, uh, even before it was recognized, uh, the... Uh, uh, DNA and, and uh, the other roles uh, uh, that uh, you had uh, work going on nucleic acid uh, yeah. even before that. Yeah. So people, of course, people came from France and all the people who got laid out Nobel Prizes and that Bob Jacob came. As a matter of fact, some of these even came before the war in 39. Uh, whole two famous people came to see me in 39. We were still the NIH was still behind the little naval hospital, and 25 of the later I and CIA took over the buildings and put new ones up. They came to see me, a very famous biophysicist, Holbeck, a French biophysicist. And he came to see me because he heard that I'm very much interested in, in, in ionizing radiation and about the mutation production. And he came to see these curves which I had. And he, he didn't speak much English, but he talked about la mutation, la mutation, in a very nice way. And then uh, Marietta Cooper had a big party for him at her house, which right, was right next to Hugo's house. And uh, it was a very famous party. He made uh, gum up. Well, everybody was there, uh, of course. Linda was there. Oh, this before your time, I'm sure. Oh, yes, very much. And so since was have been 39-40. Of course, the most exciting things were the seminars which two were in physics, where the chain reaction was first discussed before it was restricted, mm. where the report came from Hans' laboratory that the chain reaction has been established. And, uh, this one must have been in 38-39, I guess. Yes, I believe uh, it was either the end of 38 to December of 38 or January 39, it's something like, like that. Uh, and incidentally, uh, uh, I think this might be a good place to bring it out. You had uh, a biophysicist by the name of Dr. Arnold working with, yeah. you, with you. Yeah. And uh, perhaps you can either confirm or deny this. Uh, it, uh, it seems that uh, Dr. Arnold was uh, in the laboratory of Niels Bohr at the time. Uh, Lisa Meitner came from Hans' yeah. laboratory That's and right. discussed this in a seminar. Yeah. And incidentally, I was uh, uh, privileged to uh, uh, see that seminar room where this was first discovered in, Neil, in Niels Bohr's laboratory. And it was during the discussion which he described the mechanism of f fission where the nucleus sort of bulged out into two, like an hourglass, and then broke in half, and uh, I believe it was Dr. Arnold who said, well, that is just like the fission of amoeba, and at least that's the story. Now, is, uh, does it, that correspond with your understanding? I don't have much background on it, but Bill Arnold was in, 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 uh, in Copenhagen. He got his PhD in, 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 at Harvard University. And, uh, in physiology. Oh, yes. And uh, actually, when I came to Oak Ridge, he worked at Y12 with Eastman Kodak. Yes, that's right. And he came over and joined the biology division. He and Anderson were the only two biologists there. And, uh, but uh, he's, Arnold is a very intelligent and able guy. No question about it. And, uh, he did very well on, on, on photosynthesis. Oh yes. Right. Fine. You had so many uh, uh, many important developments uh, at your laboratory during these years. Yes. It's it's impossible to even uh, do it. almost list the number yeah. of uh, of things yeah. there. You work the work yeah. on photosynthesis and. Uh, yes, and right. Also, the people in the body department was checking on the quantum efficiency of photosynthesis. I was involved, not directly, 
Want the guy who did the rope was Fritz Stauffer. And uh, because, you know, one quantum one, uh, you know, the, the Warburg story, which turns out not to be entirely correct. But, and they had big controversy with Warburg on this, with Daniels and Dogger and Fritz Schaufer who did the experimental work. But I didn't work directly on photosynthesis. I saw, of course, all the work going on there. And so when I came down to Oak Ridge and saw Arnold's work, which was very well impressive, he also published a very interesting article with Oppenheimer, Incorporation of Oppenheimer, I think. Oh, yes, very at that time. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. incidentally, along this same line, something which we haven't covered yet, and that is that uh, you also, of course, organized a uh, project in the, so I guess this, you call it somatic effects of radiation. Uh, I can't uh, say it now. Then we, after we set up this big mouse genetics experiment, which worked on a germplasm, the uh, I, told, uh, I could see the necessity to have more people who work on, on animals, on mice. And I talked to Shields Warren. By the way, when Shields Warren came down to see me in 48, when he first took the job, or 49, he said, Holland, I would never approve this project on the mouse genetics. <laughs> he said, but you seem to know what you want. Go ahead, go ahead. And then 52, he wrote me a letter saying that of all the national laboratories, he thought this is the most successful one when he resigned from the Atomic Energy Commission. And, uh, and you were right, you, you followed the right track, so I don't have to worry about it. And I asked him to sit on the advisory committee after he retired from there. Uh, they said uh, he wrote a letter to, I don't know who, was it you or Weinberg? Well, probably one of us. I, of course, yeah, I, I, said, I, I admired Dr. War, uh, Shield well, Warren said, very much. Nobody yeah. needs an advisory board less than Alex Holland. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's we very interesting. We became quite, very good friends. Very here. interesting we, story. I was very close when I visited him at his home up in on, uh, Cape Cod. And all, but too bad we lost him. Yes. Yeah. Well, they, uh, uh, so uh, then you started uh, the uh, carcinogenic effects yeah. of radiation. And I said, I need a pathologist, somebody who understands tissue, mouse tissue. Yeah. And she was around said, as Jacob heard, he's always unhappy. But he is at Dallas. I think he, you could get him. So I invited him up. And he set up our mouse somatic study. And at that time, there was the first bikini test, I think. They had a lot of mice left over who had been exposed, so they had a good record of them. And Conkite, and I knew Conkite for a long time. And they said, but we don't know what to do with all these mice. And Jacob has given them to me, I will study them and see let them, let them live out their lifetime. So he caged each mouse individually. And we didn't have air conditioned laboratories yet. So we especially air conditioned the mouse, in a, a mouse a somatic study and turned out to be the most classical piece of work which had been done in, in this area up to that time. Yeah. In other words, you had uh, very good measurements of the exposure that they were subjected yeah, the to, yeah. so that you, uh, we know exactly. you had a good base from which to work. Yeah. Then the art up and joined uh, Jacob Ferd. Oh, yeah. And Jacob Ferd is one of the people who, who's could not stick to any place for very long, so he thought I didn't treat him well enough because I treat him like everybody else. I said, he said, I'm an MD, I like to have different treatment. I said, I don't treat MDs, I don't care that. Have you got an MD? We don't care. So long as you do good work, and you're doing good work, we give you all, everything we have. Oh, he said, there's, there's a man up at Harvard who will treat me like a brother, he said. So he went up to Harvard and uh, Sidney Ferber, and he treated him like a, like a skunk. <laughs> he never even gave him animal rooms. He had to rent garages to keep his wine, so of yeah. course it didn't work out well. And he yes. went to Buffalo, and from there he went to Columbia University, where he had, he had become the head of a cancer center, and he died two years ago. Oh, yes. Well, yeah, I, I can remember him very, very well, and uh, as I say, he did very 
a very good work. But, uh, very, very, one of the top pathologists in the Cornwall. Yes. Now, the, we thought at that time when Jacob Ferg left in the early, uh, that we need low level effect studies, which is a tough and complicated problem. The induction of uh, mutations we had under control, not to too level, not very low level, but the rest of us doing it. For the somatic effects, what is the lowest level which will induce malignancies? And this is very difficult, complicated, long term study. And, uh, and we set it up on the heart of them really more than under Jacob Ferd. And they had often carried it on until about uh, 63, 64, something like this. And uh, 65. But then they were told us from Washington it's too expensive. Crazy. After we spent all this money on the long term study on low level effects. And they finally reduced the budget so that they reduced the size of the experiment after data much less significant. Then store continued, and, and the data are pretty good. It's very uh, difficult. Yes, of course. Uh, the, the one thing that comes out there is that it's uh, whereas we would probably like to have an awful lot more and need an awful lot more uh, data in this field. Uh, yet uh, this work that you did uh, organize there is about the only data we have, I believe. Yes, we don't have anything else. We don't have anything else. And to, to start it, I'm. I have an idea now I would like to get started on a, a study of four or five chemical compounds and do my thorough as we did on radiation. Not more than four or five, then on the hundreds and thousands of compounds we have. Oh, yeah. And do a model type experiment. But this to do this will mean a commitment by somebody or some laboratory for ten to twenty years minimum, probably thirty years. Now, how many people would be willing to do this? That's right. So 30 years is a lifespan. It's a complete lifespan, scientific lifespan. Now, I think I have a person who's willing to do it. This is Kasha. You know Kasha, the physical chemist. Oh, yes. In Florida State. He may do it. I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. He has a but few young people who are willing to commit themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very important. But and somebody's got to do it. It's just too bad we didn't start uh, in 1950 with this uh, and continue it as a very strong program because we need the, that information now more than we ever have. And on these chemicals, we won't get the information till we do it. Yes. There's no other way of getting data. That's correct. Absolutely no other way of doing it. I just sat in a meeting. It was in at the NIH just last week. They said, why doesn't anybody do it? I said, well, who wants to commit himself for 20, 30 years? Who are you fools like I am? What do you get out of it? Three, $394 retirement before <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's the, this is the, this is exactly the, these lifetime commitments are hard to get from people. And, why should they? Why yeah, should? It is... Uh, and Congress doesn't see it. And, and so, and of course, with Congress, uh, it uh, goes up uh, uh, one year and down the next, and, and you never know about the lifetime. But you so cannot interrupt such an experiment. You're yeah. killing it. You cannot. Uh, you know, if you interrupted Russell's mouse experiment, if we had an epidemic there, nothing would have been. Yeah. We were very lucky in Oak Ridge. We never had an epidemic. Oh, yes. And uh, by keeping everybody out of his mouse farm, he keeps it clean, and he's committed to it. Yeah. And uh, as they say, the results that show it too. It's yeah, really and there's no order. Nobody else has gotten such a result. That's right. Well, that's a fascinating story, Dr. Hollander. And uh, I was wondering, what, did you actually get, uh, with regard to other things that you got started, did you get started in some of the fields of uh, uh, biotechnology and so on. Uh, I realize that wasn't a primary interest of yours, but I believe there were some uh, some things that got started. In well, uh, when I came to Washington, and I'm sorry I didn't leave Oak Ridge uh, a few years earlier, because I thought it would be so difficult to get going in Washington. Mm -hmm. I did not want to take things away from people in Oak Ridge or compete with them. Yeah. 
So I started these uh, symposia or workshops. Oh yes. They are turning out to be exceedingly successful. And I learned how to bring out books in Oak Ridge. You know, I set up an oh, editorial yeah. office in Oak Ridge. Uh, I didn't depend on my extent. Yeah, I always admired your five foot shelf of books that uh, you have published from Oak Ridge. <laughs> Only it got to be more than five feet. <laughs> uh, it, it's really, it was, it, in the 20 years I was director, we published 2,000 publications. Not a bad record. That, that's a very uh, amazing. Uh, I'm sorry. To see I, all of these publications uh, 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 in one bookshelf. But I would have liked to talk to this commission who are supposed to evaluate the national laboratories. I would have shown them that, that these national laboratories can be made very successful if you have the right people there with the right idea. But so can any other laboratory. It doesn't matter where you go. You know. That's right. Well, it takes inspiration and dedication uh, and uh, and sufficient uh, support so that it can support. Be you have to have good support. You have to have the confidence of the people who are above you, who know you are not wasting their money. You are doing it, and we done it always very economically. The laboratory was run very economically. We didn't exceed the uh, salaries. But people don't come for salaries, they rather come for ideas. I learn this more and more. And I'm working with these people in Davis, California now. It's the ideas which, which attracts the people. Yeah. And the long run, they're sure they have to have a respectable salary. But it's the ideas which in the long run really will make the thing go. Fine. Well, with all of that background now, could you just wind this up uh, for a few minutes and and give us some sort of an insight as to what you predict are going to be uh, the, uh, you might say, the wave of the future in the field of biology. Uh, are, are there two or three or four uh, uh, things that are probably going to uh, uh, grow and uh, uh, increase in importance over the next few years? Nobody would have predicted that monoclonic antibodies could be produced the way they produced in, uh, you know, the, this new immunology problem. You can never tell. Something very surprising may come up. And they, uh, these things come up. I think the application of biotechnology to plant science, which I'm right now very much interested in, will take years because the plant is still a very complicated organism. It can be handled easier than animals for certain problems, but it still will require a lot of detailed work and we will have a lot of uh, interesting symposia in between which course would keep the field alive. A very interesting one, which I just been, had telephone conversations on, is we had these terrible droughts this year, not only in this country but all over the world, especially Africa. It is possible through genetic engineering to make plants drought resistant. Now the guy who did started all this work was a Russian named Maximo, who started this in the 20s. He was encouraged to do this by a very famous geneticist, Vavilo. When I came to Russia in 33, I had a letter for him. And well, I couldn't find him. Vavilo said, talk to his wife. Well, he was in jail, and I, I said, why is he in jail? Well, he said they devel he developed a drought-resistant weed, and uh, so they, like the Soviet Union, they are, get very enthusiastic about things, and they see a success. So they planted all over Russia the drought-resistant weed, and this was the wettest year they ever had. The house was in. So they put him in jail. And I already said this in one of our symposia. The Russians treat their scientists very well, well if, they are, if they have respect for them and think that they will lead to very practical results. They give them out of wheels when they run out of wheels. In 33, they give them out of wheels. A folk in a bike, call it chemist, had an automobile, never used it. They had a beautiful apartment and all kinds of oriental rocks. We don't treat our scientists too well, but we don't put them in jail if they're, if they're uh, 
if the book doesn't turn out the way they thought it should turn out. Uh, I'm just giving this as an example of the difference between the Soviet Union and the United States. Well, fine. Well, that has given us a real, a real insight into uh, into biology, of both uh, uh, past, uh, present, and uh, future. And I sure want to thank you, uh, Dr. Hollander, for this very illuminating uh, uh, discussion. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, we will have, uh, at your suggestion, uh, uh, many of the other uh, scientists uh, who have uh, contributed uh, uh, so much uh, to our present uh, society. So uh, thank you again, and uh, we will see how this turns out.